to present your moderator for this panel, who will be also a panelist later on, Milena Stereo from down the street at Cleveland State University School of Law. We have collaborated on many, many things, and it's always a pleasure to have her involved in our project. Good morning, and welcome to this panel entitled, What Constitutes the Cats in Crime? It is my pleasure to introduce the topic of this panel, as well as our distinguished speakers. If you, as you have heard from the previous speaker, speakers and panels, in the spring of 1940 at the Katzen Forest, as well as at a few other sites, the Soviet secret police murdered close to 22,000 Polish soldiers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, and some members of the Polish intelligentsia whom Stalin wanted to eliminate so that Poland would be cleansed of those capable of offering any meaningful resistance to Stalin's oppressive regime during and after the war. This panel will seek to decipher what constitutes the cat's end crime. Professor Kenneth Letford will speak first about the Nazi discovery of the mass graves at Katten and the Third Reich attempt to use this discovery towards their advantage. Professor John Barrett will speak about Justice Jackson's role at the Nuremberg Tribunal and his willingness to charge the Germans with the Katten crime, as well as his subsequent testimony before the Madden Committee in 1952. Finally, Maria Schoenert will concentrate on the scope of the cats in crime. Now, before yielding the floor to our panelists, let me briefly highlight some of their accomplishments. Um, professor Kenneth Letford is a professor of history and law here at Case Western Reserve University. He teaches German history, European legal history, the history of European legal professions, and the history of European Union law. He received his BA with honors in history and a JD with honors from the Univers University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he was a Moorhead Fellow in law. And after practicing law for four years in Richmond, Virginia, he received his MA and PhD in Modern German and European History from the John Hopkins uh, University. He is an editor of Central European History, which is published by the Conference Group for Central European History of the American Historical Association. Professor John Barrett is a professor at St. John University School of Law. Um, he teaches constitutional law and legal history. He's the Elizabeth S. Lena Fellow and a board member of the Ro Robert Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. He's a graduate of jo Georgetown University and Harvard uh, Law School. He's a renowned teacher, writer, lecturer, and public commentator in the United States as well as internationally. Professor's, B Professor Barrett's regular Jackson List email, which pertains to Justice Jackson, Nuremberg, the Supreme Court, and related topics, now reaches over 100,000 readers across the world. Last but not least, Maria Schonert um, is the founder and president of Libra Institute. Uh, she's also the president of the Cressy Siberia Foundation USA. She's a law graduate of the University of Warsaw and Rutgers University, and she, she has worked as corporate counsel as well as a USAID capital market specialist for Europe and newly independent states. She has also served as vice president and corporate counsel for Key Corporation in Cleveland. For the past decade, she has been publishing extensively, uh, working with uh, journals, papers, as well as a leading uh, Polish language cultural weekly magazine. Now, each of our speakers will speak for about 20 minutes, and then hopefully at the end of this session, session we'll have time for questions and ans answers for, from, uh, from the audience. So without further ado, Professor Ledford. Thank you. On April 9th, 1943, Joseph Goebbels exulted in his diary over the dis uncovery of mass graves near Smolensk. Goebbels resolved to incorporate this grisly discovery into his ongoing anti-Bolshevik propaganda focus of the late winter and spring 1943, aimed to distract attention from the reeling retreat of the Wehrmacht in the east after the crushing defeat at Stalingrad in February and of the Afrika Corps in North Africa. He saw a chance to use this news to address three audiences the Polish population in the so-called general government of Poland, the Western allies of the Soviet Union, specifically Britain and the United States, and the increasingly pessimistic German population in a campaign that has been called Strength Through Fear, Kraft durch Furcht. Goebbels embarked upon a publicity campaign to spread before the world the perils of Bolshevik success, a later entry in his diary one hardly dares to imagine what would happen to Germany and Europe 
if the Asiatic Jewish flood were to inundate our country and our continent. All hands must be put to work to the last breath to prevent such a misfortune. He undertook a multi-pronged propaganda campaign literally to unearth the facts about the murdered Polish officers uncovered in the P cotton forest. And he framed a narrative that aimed to disrupt the Allied war effort against Nazi Germany. And the entire propaganda campaign embodied a cynicism breathtaking even for Goebbels. For the Nazi discovery of Soviet crimes against leadership segments of Polish state and society elided the reality from the, that from the very beginning of the German invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939, SS action groups, Einsatzgruppen, carried out mass murders of Polish intellectuals and other social leaders identical to the Soviet crime that the Wehrmacht uncovered at Katyn. Goebbels' campaign amounted to mass murderers uncovering mass murders on the part of their adversaries and seeking cynically to use that shocking discovery to the advantage of the Third Reich. Today, I want to situate the Nazi campaign to instrumentalize the cotton discovery to German advantage in three steps. First, I want to sketch the events leading up to the cotton massacre in April 1940 and the Nazi discovery of the victims in late March 1943. Second, I want to examine the course and substance as well as the immediate consequences of Nazi propaganda exploitation of the Cotton Massacre to promote Goebbels' ends. And third, uh, I want to position Cotton in the bloody 20th century history of East Central Europe as a cockpit of genocide that Timothy Snyder has recently called the Bloodlands, first to the massacre and the Nazi discovery. Timothy Snyder's per persuasive new synthesis of the history of East Central Europe in the middle of the 20th century argues that the region from central Poland to western Russia through Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states experienced a coordinated orgy of political mass murder from 1932-33 until the end of the war in 1945 and extensive oppression thereafter until at least the death of Stalin in 1953. A horror whose extent and enormity, Snyder argues, has been overshadowed by accounts on the, of the focused murder of Jews in the Holocaust. Current scholarship thus rightly returns the murder of the Polish intellectual and social elite in the professional and reserve officer corps at Katyn and elsewhere to its integral place as an episode within three decades of criminality. And the recontextualization of Cotton not only settles long open questions about its facts, but explains better how it could have occurred. Snyder details in excruciating clarity Soviet en enmity toward Poles and Poland that extended back at least to the Polish-Soviet War of 1920-21 Stalin's focus on the murder of Polish citizens of the Soviet Union during the Great Purge of 1937-38, and the eagerness of the Soviets to extend their border westward at the expense of Poland that led to the Hitler-Stalin Pact in 1939. And finally, this broadened context also clarifies how the NKVD enjoyed literally millions of opportunities to perfect the logistical and bureaucratic techniques necessary to render individualized mass murder by pistol shot in the nape of the neck, both efficient and expeditious. But the more immediate context of the Katyn massacre, of course, were the successive invasions of Poland by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in September 1939. On September 28th, their, uh, their conquests complete, Foreign Ministers Ribbentrop and Molotov signed the German-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Demarcation, modifying the previously agreed upon territorial division and extending the western border of the Soviet Union uh, into, uh, pre inter interwar por uh, westward into interwar Poland and delivering at least 100,000 Polish prisoners of war into Soviet captivity, including the officers who died at Katyn. 
But as I've indicated from the very beginning of their own invasion of Poland, the Nazis had planned mass murder of Poles. Hitler had instructed his army commanders on August 22nd, 1939, that, quote, the annihilation of Poland is in the foreground. The goal is the elimination of the living forces, not the atti attainment of a certain line, close quote. So troops of the German Wehrmacht, the army itself, murdered Polish soldiers who had surrendered, murdered civilians, raped and plundered as they advanced. But Nazi racial fixation on the elimination of so-called inferior races, including Poles, had also led to the organization of the Einsatzgruppen that accompanied the army into Poland, although with the different mission of decapitating Polish society by murdering Polish intelligentsia as well as Jews, a plan called Operation Tannenberg. Before the dissolution of the Einsatzgruppen in no on November 20th, uh, by which point German occupied Poland had been pacified, in quotation marks, these groups had murdered at least 42,000 to 50,000 Poles. And all of this murder, of course, was only prelude to massive Nazi plans to conduct ethnic cleansing of Poles from the e western part of their territory, the so-called Wartegau, by expelling them to the east to provide empty farmland on which to resettle Germans. Thus, when the Soviets, in September 1939, began to arrest, deport, and execute Polish intellectuals in their occupied zone of Poland, their policy differed in no way from that of Germans in Poland to the West. These purges and murders by the Soviets of Poles as Poles, which merely continued the policies of the murders of the Great Purge, as well as Soviet policy toward officers among the Polish prisoners of war, only culminated in the murders at Katyn and other sites in the spring of 1940. Together, these campaigns show neither any new departure in Soviet policy nor any differentiation of Soviet from Nazi policy. But of course, the framework situation and the lineup of interests changed radically when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941. Suddenly, the Soviets became not only the allies of the British, but of the Polish government in exile in London, which had a vital interest in the whereabouts of the 1939 POWs, as did the British, who were desperate for troops to put into battle against the Germans. Conversely, the German invasion of the Soviet Union turned erstwhile allies and accomplices into enemies. The lightning German advance toward Moscow reached beyond Smolensk in late July 1941, behind schedule but still remarkably swift. Secure in the rear, Signal Regiment 537 of Army Group Center set up its operations near a bend in the Dnieper River west of Smolensk at a wood called Katyn near a train station called Gniezdovo. I apologize to all the Poles. I don't speak Polish, so you're going to get German pronunciations of Polish uh, and other place names. During the summer of 1942, Polish forced laborers in the Katyn forest heard rumors from Russians that, the Polish, that Polish countrymen had been murdered by the Soviets nearby. On their own time, these workers began to ex excavate finding human remains, and they marked the spot with a wooden cross, but they did not report their discovery to the German authorities. The German commander, Colonel Friedrich Ahrens, later recalled that during the winter of 1943, he, thinks, he thought January or February, he tracked a wolf through the woods and discovered it had been digging on, a mound, on the mound with the wooden cross, and he directed his troops to investigate as to the kind of bones contained in the mound and was informed by doctors that they were human. He reported this discovery to Army Group Center in late February, which dispatched Professor Dr. Gerhard Butz, a forensic pathologist, formerly professor of forensic pathology and criminology at the center, uh, uh, at that pathological center uh, at the University of Breslau, Wrocław, and currently, at the time, on the medical staff of Army Group Center. He was sent to investigate. 
Boots, on March 1st, began to plan to exhume the graves and conduct autopsies on the remains found in them. But the harsh freeze of winter delayed the actual start of work until March 29th. By the time of an interim report on April 10th, in a single grave, workers had uncovered 12 layers of 250 corpses each for a total of 3,000 dead. In this interim report, out of 100 corpses, 65 had been identified by means of identity cards, diaries or letters in their pockets, or otherwise, and 39 of the 65 were clearly Polish army officers. Excavation continued at seven graves through June the 1st, resulting in the discovery of 4,143 corpses, of whom 2,815 had, in June, been clearly identified. And the clothing of the dead was plainly recognizable as Polish army uniforms. Although news of the discovery initially remained within the chain of command of the Wehrmacht and the Feldpolizei, by early April, the word had reached the Reich's propaganda ministry in Berlin, where Go Goebbels himself learned of it on April 1st or 2nd. And he knew he had a prime propaganda opportunity and determined to exploit it carefully. Before announcing the discovery to the world, he arranged for a delegation of Polish leaders to fly from Warsaw, Krakow, Lublin to Smolensk on April 10th where they were taken to the Katyn forest and shown two excavations from which 250 bodies had already been exhumed. The next day, his propaganda effort began with the first mention of the discovery of the graves by a German news agency, which evoked a reply in a pro-Soviet Polish language radio broadcast from Moscow. But it was the Berlin radio broadcast of April 13th which placed the discovery uh, before world media, uh, describing it as a place in which the Bolsheviks had secretly perpetrated mass executions and where the GPU had murdered 10,000 Polish uh, officers. On April 15th, the Soviets denied their guilt, <laughs> denouncing the, quote, vile fabrication by German fascist murderers. And on April 17th, the Polish government issued a, dec a statement of grave concern condemning the murders while denouncing German hypocrisy and exploiting them in consideration of German crimes against Poles and Poland. Although the Germans quickly agreed to a Polish government proposal for an investigation by the International Committee for the Red Cross, the ICRC conditioned its involvement on the invitation of all states involved, and there was clarity that the Soviets would not agree to such an investigation. The Polish Red Cross, under German pressure in the general government, and despite reservations and concerns about being used for German propaganda purposes, sent a technical commission, as well as its secretary, to Katyn on April 14th, where it was augmented by additional members on the 19th, and where it worked on the site until June 7th, when it produced a final report. Alongside the teams commanded by Boots and the Germans, and the Polish Red Cross, a third group of experts, an international physicians commission invited by the Germans and consisting of forensic pathologists from 12 German allies or, or states occupied or surrounded by Germany, there was a Swiss, and seven of these physicians conducted autopsies on April 28th and 30th. Although some work at the site continued until uh, June of 1943, by the end of April, the essential facts had been framed. And it's to the propaganda effort to propagate these facts, uh, to have them believed, and to shape the effect that I now turn. Goebbels sought to exploit the, the cotton discovery as part of a propaganda of pessimism that he began after Stalingrad, and which is perhaps best immortalized in his February 18, 1943, Sport, Sportpalast uh, speech, Do You Want Total War? In doing this, Goebbels sought to address three audiences. The Poles in the general government, in an effort to mobilize them to side with the Germans in defense against the onrushing Red Army. 
the Western allies in an effort to sow dissension between them and their Soviet ally on the already contentious issue of post-war Poland, and to undermine the recently announced policy of unconditional surrender and open the possibility of Germany making a separate peace with one side or the other. And finally, the German people, to steal them for increased uh, defensive effort by instilling in them fear of the consequences of a Soviet victory. Goebbels began with a press campaign to vilify the Soviets and deepen the Nazi rhetorical mo motif that equated Bolshevism and Jews. The Nazi newspaper, the Völkische Beobachter, resounded with articles titled, The Mass Murder of Cotton, The Work of Jewish Butchers, and Judah's Blood Guilt Grows to the Unfathomable, Unermesslich. He worked with care to include gruesome footage of the exhumations and autopsies in the weekly newsreels, and expressed his frustration when the German army prevailed in excluding the shots out of concern for the feelings of families of German soldiers also reported to be missing and captured. Might they have met the same fate? Goebbels succeeded in screening a widely uh, uh, viewed uh, documentary film, In Walde von Katten. And the German Foreign Office contributed by releasing in fall 1943 a massive book-length publication, official material on the mass murder at Cotton, 331 pages long, consisting of affidavits, reports, photographs, and a detailed listing by name of all 4,143 dead. An undated propaganda pamphlet, but clearly from 1943, reproduced the report of the International Physicians Commission and a collection of stark photographs. And its text concluded, the chapter of Katyn is closed. It will live on as the greatest and most brutal mass murder in world history, but it is only one, albeit an especially gruesome case, of Jewish Bolshevik uh, practice of murder, mord praxis. Katyn is a dreadful textbook example of what Bolshevism, with the silent support of England and America, would do in Europe if Bolshevism and its Jewish executioners were to succeed in penetrating into the West and inundating the civilized lands of Europe. If that were to happen, the mass grave of tomorrow would no longer be called Katyn, but rather Europe. On one level, this propaganda campaign paid dividends, and Goebbels certainly took credit for it. When the Polish government's request for an ICRC investigation coincided in time with a German request, Stalin took the opportunity to denounce the Poles as Nazi collaborators and to sever diplomatic relations on April 25th, a step he really had already decided to take. But the primary goal of the British government all along remained to prevent the discovery of the mass murder of Poles from damaging Anglo-Soviet relations and the behavior of Britain and the United States, both of whom quickly concluded that the Soviets, despite their denials, had committed this crime, consistently subordinated the interests of justice and truth for the Polish victims at Katyn to those of maintaining the wartime alliance until the final defeat of the Germans. The title, indeed, of one recent article best sums this attitude up, Against Better Knowledge, the Silence of the Western Allies About Cotton. And ironically, the accommodating attitudes of Britain and the United States helped to persuade Stalin that they would insist on unconditional surrender, and he decided not to, speak, not to uh, seek a separate peace with the Nazis. An op a viable option for him between the victories at Stalingrad in February and at Kursk in July. Only with the German people did Goebbels' propaganda of pessimism succeed. A series of recent histories uh, uh, of, of 1945 has focused on the cataclysmic murderousness of the months January through April during which, which the German Wehrmacht suffer, suffered one quarter of its total killed during the entire war. More German soldiers died January to April 1945 than died in all of 1942 and 43 combined. 
German civilians and soldiers alike bore the burdens of the bombing campaign and invasion, fighting to the end, both convinced of the barbarity of the Red Army and aware that Germany's own genocides meant that their enemies would show no mercy to the Germans. To conclude, this very farrago of propaganda lies received as truth and truth dismissed as lies that clouded the view of Katyn in 1943 and extended through much of the Cold War is an example of the complexity that Timothy Snyder argues has blurred historians' vision of the experiences of the bloodlands until the very recent past. As the shackles of the Cold War now recede more than two decades into the past, it's incumbent upon lawyers, historians, and statesmen alike to tell the story of the Cotton Massacre in its fullest and richest context as a matter of restorative justice and of mastery of the past, as our contribution to efforts to ensure that no bloodlands again blight the face of Europe. Thanks. Good morning. I'm very grateful to Case Western University for assembling this very important conference on this very important topic, particularly to my friend Michael Scharf. It is, as Mr. Adamczyk said, uh, a word, an event, a piece of history that should be so much more widely known. And perhaps our generation and this moment and this conference is part of an important turn in that direction. And I'm very honored to be part of this. My topic is Justice Robert H. Jackson in the Katyn Forest. And of course, he, the American chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial, in fact, never set foot in Katyn Forest. Um, so it is not a literal travel log of any kind. It is instead a historical survey of a high official's responsibility, the prosecution effort at Nuremberg, and the historical accomplishment and failure of Nuremberg with regard to the truth on this topic. And I'm going to approach this in three parts. First, uh, building on Ken's excellent scholarship and presentation, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the crime, but the crime as it came to the knowledge of Robert Jackson as he was embarking on this Nuremberg assignment. Second, I'm going to speak about the Nuremberg trial to some degree, and I think in a sense, introduce Professor Shabus's, uh presentation this afternoon, which will continue on that topic. Third, I'm going to consider the Nuremberg trial on trial, if you will, the after scrutiny that Nuremberg received for its treatment of Katyn and what was and wasn't done at Nuremberg. So part one, the crime. Uh, April 1943 is for the West, through the media, through Goebbels, and the German announcement of the discovery in the Katyn Forest, the moment of knowledge, the moment of uh, zero becoming some increment of awareness. And Robert Jackson at that time is a US Supreme Court justice. He's been on the court three years. He's a young lawyer of enormous public stature. Uh, he's not yet 50 years old, or he, I'm sorry, he's just turned 50 years old. And he has been up through Roosevelt's cabinet and then onto the Supreme Court, really the rising leading lawyer legal figure of this country in that generation. He was nearly the president of the United States, or at least the Democratic nominee in 1940. He was assumed to be likely to be, again, a presidential prospect or chief justice or something huge. And in the meantime, he was something huge. He was an associate justice on the Supreme Court. He was the best pen on the court. And he was wrestling with the work of the court, which included a docket entirely unrelated to this Katyn news and this war context and the topic that we're here for today. Except it wasn't all separate. Because Robert Jackson, like any responsible, serious, uh, person, citizen in that time, was an avid consumer of the news. And of course, his small world of contacts included the very top levels of the Roosevelt administration and the Supreme Court and so forth. So his front pages, Washington Post, Washington Times Herald, New York Times, uh, Herald Tribune, et cetera, et cetera, in those days included 
the side-by-side -side stories that were the unfolding of the Katyn revelations and then the Russian denials and alongside that other events of April 1943. Um, I don't think it's been mentioned, but if you pull up those front pages, you will see that the Warsaw Ghetto uprising and the final liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto occurs simultaneously with this revelation. So as we think of, of bloodlands and Poland being sliced down the middle and east and west, those are adjacent stories, atrocities, information revelations in that month. And here's a glimpse of it in the work of Robert H. Jackson. Students of American constitutional law and history may know that one of his most famous opinions is the court's opinion handed down in June of 1943 in West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. It is the court's invalidation on First Amendment uh, freedom of expression and conscience grounds of the West Virginia state law that compelled school children to stand and salute the flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. A similar law from the state of Pennsylvania had been upheld by the Supreme Court just three years earlier. And so the court in this short interval, which includes the United States moving from uninvolved but an aid to Great Britain to involved in the World War, is a time of a jurisprudential switch on this issue. And Jackson and other new appointees and some justices who are changing their votes from the first case constitute the majority that Jackson writes for in the Barnett case. Now, Jackson was a very autonomous, very skilled writer, and his drafts of really everything survive. And you're able to watch his craftsmanship and his beautiful prose take shape. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite capture everything that's in the head or that's part of the intellectual process behind the drafting. But what one finds in West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett, handed down in June of 1943, but drafted in March and April and May of 1943, is two passages that I think reflect very tangibly the front page and the adjacent news items, atrocity, terror, war information that is part of his screen. One is the word ghetto, which he reaches out to use in the Barnett opinion. Um, and it's not something one finds in any previous piece of his writing or that I've been able to find in any subsequent piece of his writing. It is a 1943 use of a word that is, of course, the Warsaw word. The other thing one finds is in his description of why we can afford to let Jehovah's Witness school children who have a religious scruple against saluting a graven object, even our own flag, choose that as a matter of conscience over a compelled patriotism is because the American First Amendment order stands against compelled orthodoxy, compelled unanimity. The alternative Jackson writes, and here I think, I suspect I know what news item informs his pen as he's drafting. The alternative is the unanimity of the graveyard. Now the most famous cemetery in the world, the graveyard of the spring of 1943 is Katyn. Part two, Nuremberg. The Nuremberg assignment that comes to Justice Jackson comes from President Truman, who has succeeded Franklin Roosevelt, who had, of course, committed that the high Nazi perpetrators would be prosecuted as criminals after the war. And Roosevelt dies just before the Allied victory in Europe, and Truman inherits this plan and looks and follows everyone's consensus that the leading lawyer to embody this of stature and ability is Justice Jackson. It's inconceivable in our day that a president, I think, would pluck a sitting Supreme Court justice, not let him resign, <clears throat> tolerate him being AWOL for a year, and send him abroad to do something entirely executive branch in nature. But that's what it was because of who Jackson was. And that was a message across the alliance, principally to England and to the Soviet Union and to a lesser extent to the newly reconstituted French Republic that this was a top level serious responsibility, that this was in a sense the continuation of the military alliance now leaving the field of war and moving to the restoration of law. And what those allies led by Jackson do is meet and do diplomatic work in London in the summer of 1945. They have to work out a shared system of law and architecture for creating a new international tribunal all kinds of procedures about how it will operate. None of that had been laid as groundwork in advance. And so during the summer of 1945, across a square table at Westminster Abbey, 
Jackson, Russian counterparts, British counterparts, French counterparts, work out what that fall comes to be Nuremberg. In those London discussions, they come to agreements about the crimes that are embodied in the August 1945 London Agreement. The principal pri crime is war itself. Conspiracy to commit it and other crimes is the concept of Nazism. And the related crimes are war crimes, historically well-established international norms of rules of law applying to war itself, the Hague, and et cetera, and the new concept of crimes against humanity. And it takes some very hard discussions and some uh, sort of stare downs and threatens, threats to blow up the alliance uh, before everyone agrees on what's really an American model. In those London discussions, which include many side discussions of potential defendants who have been captured, evidence that is being assembled, uh, the looking ahead to the trial, there is not that I have found a trace of a discussion of charging the Katyn massacre as a crime at what comes to be Nuremberg. So they've got these crimes, they've got this evidence, they've got these prisoners, they're on this march. Katyn is not part of this storyline. Into the fall of 1945, after they've selected the site, after they're assembling the evidence, as they're drafting the indictment, the Russians insert a sentence. Their proposal is to charge the Germans as in, for American lawyers, a bill of particulars with, among many other things, the murders of over 900 Polish officers at, at Katyn. The drafting process is principally American and British in nature, but General Jan Nikachenko is the Russian participant, and he keeps trying to insert this sentence. And the Brits, who really have the principal pen, keep redlining it and taking it out. Back and forth, back and forth. And eventually, as a matter of allied insistence, the Russians say, this is one of the things. Now, why don't the British and the Americans like the idea of charging this crime? Well, because as the newspapers and discourse has shown from 1943 up until this September 1945 moment, this is a disputed proposition. It is a he said, they say, back and forth. Unlike everything else that Robert Jackson and the British subscribing to this plan intended to base the case on, this one was not based on uncontested documentary evidence. The Germans had kept meticulous, thorough records and destroyed many, but not a lot. And that had been captured and analyzed, and that was the backbone of what Nuremberg was preparing to do. And to that, the Russians wanted to add something pointing to the Germans as the perpetrators of Katyn that, of course, didn't have smoking guns or other German documentation of the type that this trial was to be about. But alliance uh, deference and comedy, I think, uh, prevails, and that sentence remains in the proposed indictment. Jump to Berlin in October of 1945. The indictment is actually about to be officially filed before the tribunal. The Soviet staffing has changed. Nikachenko has moved from the chief of counsel prosecutorial role to the chief judge role. Roman Rodenko has arrived from Moscow as the chief prosecutor, and he's the Russian chief prosecutor through the trial. And Rodenko, on the eve of the indictment's return, proposes to change the number. The 900 number now becomes an 11,000 number. And he's got an explanation that 900 was based on a sampling and a failure to do the multiplication based on the sampling, and et cetera. Uh, but now we're on the brink of returning the indictment, and Katyn, in its full false accusation against the Germans, is what the indictment contains. Again, at the 11th hour, privately behind the scenes, the Americans, the British, I think even the French, who were generally the passive fourth participant at Nuremberg, uh, say, we don't need to include this. It's important to look at the Nuremberg indictment to see how small a piece it is and how, in a sense, and no insensitivity is intended by this, how surplus any particular sentence was. The criminal charges against the 24 individuals and the six organizations are spanning crimes. And then the sentences, if you will, are illustrative particulars, no one of which is required to demonstrate the waging of aggressive war, the commission of war crimes, the commission against, of crimes against humanity, or a cl common plan or agreement to engage in all of those crimes. And the indictment is quite a thick 
assemblage of particulars, illustrations, based on the captured documents. But any of those could have been dispensed with, just as this sentence for the theory of the case could have been dispensed with. But it's not. The charges returned in October, and the trial begins in November. Jackson delivers the opening statement that is properly remembered as perhaps the most brilliant English language courtroom speech in history. And this sentence, this accusation, is not mentioned. Neither is it mentioned in the opening statements, which occur over a series of weeks, that the British chief prosecutor, the Russian chief prosecutor, and the French chief prosecutor deliver. In fact, the government's case, if you will, first the American case, which is the first two counts, the conspiracy and the waging of aggressive war, is entirely presented. The British case, which uh, sort of, for shorthand, spans the same territory, the French case and the Soviet cases, which are territorial, East and West responsibilities for war crimes and crimes against humanity, are almost entirely presented without the word Katyn being breathed in the Nuremberg courtroom. Until February, very near the close of prosecutorial evidence, when a British, I'm sorry, a Russian assistant prosecutor, Comrade Pokrovsky, uh, summarizes the finding of the Soviet white paper. Uh, the 1944, et cetera, blaming it on the Germans, Soviet report. He's presenting this pr pursuant to a provision of the London Agreement, which says the tribunal may take judicial notice of allied government reports. And so he says we have a Russian report that said the Germans did Katyn. That's the end of the prosecution as it stands at that moment. The defense cases are about to begin. And here, in an ironic way, and I assure you my tongue is in my cheek, um, the hero of the truth about Katyn asserts himself. His name's Hermann Goering. And he tells his lawyer, Otto Stammer, the Wehrmacht did not do this. And you must defend the good name, I'm quoting Hermann Goering, of the Wehrmacht by challenging this charge. I authorize you to do it. I will assist you in doing it. And so Goering, defending himself, and he not particularly connected to any part of the Soviet white paper on the Germans did Katyn, authorizes his lawyer to make that part of the Goering defense. And Stammer begins to push. He first argues to the tribunal that I want witnesses. It takes months, but he's eventually granted witnesses. Uh, there's an attempt to negotiate that down to affidavits by the Soviets, and Stammer won't give up his ground. And at the very end of the trial, what the court authorizes is each side presenting three witnesses. We'll hear three from you on the defense side, and then we'll hear three from the Soviets on the prosecutorial side. And those are the last six witnesses who testify in the Nuremberg trial. And you'll hear more about it, but at that point, the word Katyn is never heard again. Not one of those six witnesses mentions any defendant. It's, it's a flop. Stammer, if you will, succeeds in defending the good name of the Wehrmacht. Now, where is Jackson as the Russians are prosecuting this? Well, he is, of course, familiar with the public reports. He's also familiar with and getting little blips of input across the trial that this is still contested and we're not sure about the Russian charge against the Germans. There is information that polls in the United States communicate through Jackson's son that the Russians did it. There's a cable that comes to him at Nuremberg in January of 1946 from Arthur Bliss Lane, the American ambassador in Warsaw, saying, actually, it may be the case that the Russians and the Germans did Katyn together. Uh, and there are contrary reports saying the Germans did it after all. But just little blips along the way. They don't know, and frankly, it's on the Russians anyway, so they don't have to figure it out. One other piece, Poland at Nuremberg. Uh, actually in London, the Free Poles, uh, and at Nuremberg, there are representatives who are interacting with Jackson, who are Poles, uh, who are subscribers to the Nuremberg Project, who are supporters, and they don't take a particularly strong critical position against what the Russian prosecutors are doing. Um, and that's interesting. They also are admiring, and of course this gets complicated with the history of Poland, but they are admiring of Jackson's accomplishments. So much so that in May of 1946, he is awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from the University of Warsaw. He's unable to make the trip to receive it in person, 
but that's the Polish verdict, if you will, the Polish government verdict, and you know what that means by the spring of 46 on Jackson's performance. Now an interlude before I get to part three. In the fall of 1947, there is an enormous ceremony in Washington, D.C. at the Polish Embassy at which that degree is physically delivered to, conferred upon Justice Jackson. And that's really the end for him of Katyn, Nuremberg, Poland, etc., until it comes back. Part three, the trial on trial. I can go quickly and you'll hear more about this later, but the facts start to emerge, the truth starts to emerge, the drumbeat of the Russians did it becomes louder and louder. Books and press, including a book by Ambassador Lane, becomes uh, part of this public discourse. And in 1951, Polish American constituency representatives from representing members of the U.S. House of Representatives passed the resolution that creates the Madden Committee. Uh, it's an honor that Representative Kaptur is here and uh, Representative Kucinich was here earlier. The U.S. House of Representatives performs quite, I think, a heroic function in the performance of this committee. Its 1951 context is important to realize. It is McCarthyism, it is the Cold War, it is the Korean War, it is Polish-American political pressure for truth to be heard and justice to be done on Katyn, and it is the 1952 campaign of Dwight Eisenhower, who is a counterpart of sorts of Jackson's, and if Nuremberg is culpable of something on Katyn, this is an issue about Ike. Jackson recognizing this context and being aware of this committee uh, knows what he needs to do. Just like in the Barnett case, uh, he uncaps his pen and starts to write. Long before he's asked to testify, he begins to draft testimony. And over many months in the spring of 1952, we're nine years down from his drafting of ghetto and unanimity of the graveyard in Barnett, he's writing testimony about how Katyn was happened at, handled at Nuremberg. The hearings take a while to reach Jackson. Before they get to him, Robert Kempner, one of his assistant prosecutors at Nuremberg, testifies before Madden Committee hearings that are held in Frankfurt, Germany. He's asked, was Nuremberg a conspiracy among the Allies to pin on the Germans, something you all knew the Russians had done? And Kempner says, you know, not to my knowledge, you'd have to ask Jackson. A little bit of an odd phrasing, and he writes Jackson a very sheepish apologetic letter. I didn't mean that the way it came out. Another witness who testifies is Otto Stammer, Goering's lawyer. And he's asked, was Nuremberg an effort across the alliance, the Americans and the Brits in bed with the Russians, to pin it on the German? And Stammer says, God, of course not. The Americans, the British, Nuremberg was totally fair to me. They gave me discovery. They gave me resources. In fact, they paid him and they gave him housing. And they let me defend the Wehrmacht against this libelous charge that the Germans had done Katyn. All of that somewhat already diffuses the Nuremberg issue before the time Jackson testifies. But on November 11, think, by the way, historically about that day, on November 11, 1952, Jackson testifies before the Madden Committee. Uh, Supreme Court justices do testify on the Hill but about budgets and Supreme Court renovations and so forth, uh, it's quite unusual to have a substantive inquiry call a sitting Supreme Court justice, it's not a subpoena, he appears voluntarily, uh, to explain his conduct. You know, the Senate has confirmation hearings and then that's usually the last time you get into a Supreme Court justice's past. Jackson comes to the committee and delivers powerful, direct, and I think fully satisfactory testimony. He's diffusing two misimpressions or charges that the House is bringing, really, against Nuremberg. One is this idea of conspiracy, that it was a cabal to pin it on the Germans. The other is a notion of underperformance. There's a bit of a legislative idea among the Madden Committee members that Nuremberg's job was to figure out who did it and to prosecute them. In fact, one of the members says, well, there were four nations, so if three of you had voted to turn around and indict the Russian guy sitting next to you, why didn't you do that? Uh, well, the London Agreement is very clear. It's a one-year project for Axis perpetrators of crimes. In other words, German criminals. The jurisdiction of Nuremberg did not allow the justice that the facts by this time were showing. And the Madden Committee demonstrates its, I think, ultimate satisfaction by, in its final report, quoting Jackson's final paragraph of his testimony. 
Jackson closed by saying, this history will show if it is now deemed possible to establish responsibility for the Katyn murders, nothing that was decided by the Nuremberg Tribunal or contended for by the American prosecution will stand in your way. And I think that's still true. Nuremberg did well on what it did, including ditching and abandoning the canard that the Soviets were prosecuting against the Germans with regard to Katyn. But Nuremberg was not for one time and all purposes a truth commission on Katyn. That remains, in a sense, our task. Jackson sent the Madden Report and his testimony to his important counterparts, and I will close on this. He sent it to the British judges and prosecutors. He even sent it to a couple of French counterparts from Nuremberg. Interestingly, he did not send it to any of the Soviet counterparts. The curtain had come down on those former alliance relationships. And he got a letter back from Khaki Roberts. He got letters back from all of them. They were you know, transatlantic pen pals. But I want to read a, a sentence or two from Khaki Roberts's letter. He was an assistant British prosecutor. He's a former rugby star. He's the enormous man you see in Nuremberg pictures. You have a bunch of lawyers and then a giant. That's George D. Khaki Roberts. Khaki was his uniform color. And he writes back to Jackson, thanks for sending this statement about the wood of macabre and evil memory. I read it with the greatest interest and shall always keep it in my Nuremberg records. One of the great, quote, unsolved, close quote, and then parentheses, question mark, mysteries of history. They suspected, and over time, I think it's fair to say they more or less knew they being the British, they being the Americans, the French as a trailer, that the effort to pin it on the Wehrmacht was wrong. And Nuremberg did justice by not allowing that Russian effort to succeed. Thank you. I may need some computer help. Uh, technical engineer, please help. <laughs> it's out of our hands. How do I move it? Okay. 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 Good. Uh, well, uh, with a speed of light, I would like to. Um, address the issue of the Katyn Forest Massacre in the context of the um, several types of genocidal practices directed at the Polish national group um, by the leadership of the Soviet Union between 39 and 41. We must remember that for 40 years we understood Katyn uh, as a Katyn, massacre, uh, Katyn Forest Massacre. That particular one location with those uh, mass graves of uh, 4,400 uh, bodies. That was in our um, imagination, the meaning of the word cutting. Today we know that this is uh, only a drop in a bucket, that this is only one of many locations and some of them are discovered today and some are not. So um, we know from, uh, from the uh, March 5th, um, 1940 execution order, we know that the Soviet Politburo uh, sentenced to death uh, 25,700 uh, Polish prisoners of war and Polish civilians arrested on the uh, conquered Polish territory. They, the, 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 the number they, the, they wanted to kill was 25,700. We know from the report from, um, from the internal uh, Soviet Union report from 59, when they decided to destroy all the files of those people murdered, uh, that um, this uh, report uh, indicates that they managed to kill 21,857 um, um, citizens of Poland uh, pursuant to March 5th execution order. Um, now, um, obviously, the most famous location with those uh, victims is in the Katyn Forest, discovered in 43, 
and um, the investigation, the International Red Cross investigation, confirmed um, that um, over 4,400 uh, bodies of the Polish officers were found in the, those grace, graves. Out of this number, about 2,800 were identified positively by the Polish Red Cross on the scene in uh, 1943. Um, and also the, the subsequent uh, Russian report, the so-called Burdenko report, uh, never questioned the fact that those were the Polish officers, never questioned the identity of the victims, only the timing of the crime. Um, the um, other locations were discovered basically uh, after 1990s, after the time when the, um, 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 Gorbachev first and then Yeltsin uh, subsequently delivered the March 5th execution order to the Polish side in 1992. And that is when basically during that time two other um, sites of um, mass graves were discovered and identified. Today we know that the pro Polish prisoners of war from Starobielsk camp were murdered in Kharkov and uh, buried in the Piatihatki uh, forest. And that's where um, the father of uh, Mr. Adamczyk was buried. Um, we know uh, that this, those graves were subsequently uh, mm, demolished and uh, there was a clear effort to um, destroy the evidence of the crime in this, in this uh, particular site. The uh, other special camp with the Polish prisoners of war was lo located in Ostaszku camp and that was the largest camp, over 6,000 uh, prisoners of war, primarily policemen and uh, um, gendar gendarmerie, I guess, <laughs> uh, policemen primarily. And this is a, also, again, the, um, the bodies of the, pri uh, the prisoners from Ostaszków were taken to Kalinin Tver, Tver NKVD dungeons, let's put it this way, to the NKVD headquarters in Kalinin, and they were murdered there and buried in Med Miednoje. Uh, what's very interesting is that when the Soviet Union began the investigation, their own investigation into the Katyn crime in 1991, uh, there was an opportunity to interview um, Mr. Tokariev, who was the chief of NKVD at Kalinin during those executions. And uh, I, I think it's worthwhile to, uh, quote, to, to give a quote from his testimony but, uh, because uh, it carries certain weight. We went and bec uh, first of all, he, he testified that Stalin sent his top executioner from Moscow to Kalinin, uh, Mr. Uh, Vasil Blochin, uh, specifically for the purposes of preparing, planning, and implementing the execution of the Ostashkov prisoners. So uh, Blochin with his team came to Kalinin and with the help of Tokariev, they planned this whole process of exterminating over 6,000 Polish prisoners of war. And uh, Tokariev in uh, 1991 recalls the moment when they were ready to go. We went, and that is when I noticed all this horror. Blochin put on his special clothing, brown leather cap, long leather protective garment, brown leather gloves with cuffs above elbow. It made a tremendous impact on me. I saw the executioner. And Blochin team worked very efficiently and with great speed, extinguishing li one life every two minutes. And Tokariev, um, and I read some commentaries that if he even said that with a certain prize, pride, that it was a truly industrial undertaking. Now, those three prisoners of war camps, uh, Kozielk, Starobiesk, and Ostaszkov, they pertain to the prisoners of war, people captured on the battlefield during the invasion of Poland. 
but the other group of those condemned by the March 5th execution order were over 7,000 people arrested on the Polish territory incorporated to the Soviet Union. So in other words, Eastern Poland taken over by the Soviet Union, the, the NKVD death squads were, according to the prescription list of the uh, well-committed uh, communists on the ground, to certain analogy with the German minority in Poland, they were preparing prescription lists for the execution of the Polish elite. The same was done on the, on the Soviet side of, the Poli of, of, the, of incorporated territories. And according to those lists, the, the arrests were made. Uh, and um, uh, simultaneously with preparing the um, extermination of the prisoners of war from those camps, uh, Beria sent orders to the local prisons in Belarusia and Ukraine to congregate all those prisoners in uh, several locations. From Belarusia, everybody was shipped to Minsk, and from Ukraine, they were shipped the prisoners in the prisons. Uh, in Ukraine, were shipped uh, to... Um, uh, to two other three locations, including Kiev, Kharkov, and Kherson. They were murdered there, and frankly, we have the least information about those victims. We know today that uh, very recently, this is, this is still an untold story. We are still in the process of researching this. But at least we know today that most of those civilians killed pursuant to this March 5th execution order were buried in Kuropaty mass graves in Ukraine and in Bykovnia in mass graves uh, cemetery in Belarusia. Altogether, according to the internal Russian documentation, uh, Soviet documentation, uh, 7,300 7, uh, and some. Okay, now, uh, so we have the killings of the prisoners of war, the killings of the civilians, and at the same time, uh, the um, um, Politburo, the top leadership, Beria, Stalin, um, and uh, Mawotov to some extent was, but primarily Beria was planning uh, the deportation of the families of the condemned men uh, to, uh, from Eastern Poland to forcibly remove the families of those condemned men from the conquered Polish lands. Uh, so bef bet between March, March 5th and April the 5th, when they started those executions, they were collecting the list of their family members to make sure that they, those people can be removed from their homes and sent into oblivion. Uh, they, they, they started March 2nd with the first order for deportations. March 7th, uh, they, uh, requ they sent requests to compile lists for family members. And the March 20th uh, order is interesting because um, it says that uh, those family members must be deported to Siberia. Please show me the time when I... Um, uh, they, they must be uh, sent to Siberia, and they are saying, Beria is saying in this order, that we plan to deport 25,000 families. That's interesting, because we are killing 25,700 people by March 5th order. So the logic is, okay, we, we killed 25,000, so now we deport 25,000 families. And he even is precise enough to estimate that each family is between three and five members because he uh, indicates that those deportations of the family members will be between 75,000 and 100 thousand people. From our experience uh, as a Crisis Siberia group a member, we are re recording testimonies of the people deported, and we know that average size of the family deported to Siberia was between five and seven people. So the estimate of uh, three to five is very low, on a very low side. Okay, so those are deportations which are in inherent component of the killings. Those are the two sides, two types of genocide, uh, genocidal action directed at the Polish people at the same time. As, uh, this is critically important because when, we, when we, in our notion, the, we, we think about cutting as killings. No, this is much more than killings. This is uh, um, killings, deportations, and really uh, genocidal uh, practices uh, geared towards exterminating the Polish national group on the Polish territory incorporated to the Soviet Union. And to prove that very quickly, um, this is the, a card, a postcard sent from Starobielsk uh, to, by Mr. Herzog 
uh, uh, prisoner of war from Starobielsk. He's writing to his family in Lubaczów near Lwów. And he's saying in this postcard that I will be transferred to another location and uh, you will not hear from me for a long time. What's interesting is this card was written on April the 6th, just a day before he was shipped to his death. And the uh, correspondence of the prisoners of war was stopped in the middle of March. So this card supposed not to go anywhere. But there was a guy, a Polish guy at Starobiersk, an employee, who actually crossed out the, the uh, hometown address of his family and he himself in his own hand wrote on this postcard their new address on the deportation location in Kazakhstan. So this card, instead of going to Lubachev, went directly to Kazakhstan to some kind of a settlement in the middle of a desert where his family with his father, mother, wife, and, th uh, and three children were deported on April the 13th. Okay, so that card went straight to Kazakhstan, meaning that those people in, in Starobielsk, they had the deportation lists in front of them, which shows how integral, uh, how um, uh, closely related those two actions are. This is the card that he wrote. Um, now, if, if you think this is bad, <laughs> this is a piece of cake, because this was already a second mass deportation. The first mass deportation took place on February the 10th. Uh, and this was a huge, massive deportation prepared by the Soviet Politburo and by the Beria. The uh, directives and orders for the first mass deportation from the Polish territories went out in December, starting December 5th, with precise instructions how to deport, whom to deport, and, uh, and where to deport uh, between December 5th and December 30th. Very precise operation, very impressive, by the way. And who was subjected to it? Uh, um, local authorities, mayors and uh, council, local city council people, the military families, all, all together, men, everybody, and uh, railroad workers and forestry workers, all together a couple hundred uh, uh, people, a couple hundred thousand people, and the numbers are still not being uh, determined. Huge numbers. This was the, the critically important deportation because if you imagine to expel in the middle of the night the family of five, just take them from their beds and put them on the sled, then put them on the train to Siberia in the middle of no, uh, February 1940. The highest uh, death rate in this deportation. Horrible. Next. Then we have two more waves of deportations. They don't stop. They, they, we have the February, the first one, then the families of the condemned men. Then we have June deportation, when they deport those people, mostly those who were trying to escape the Nazi oppression in Western Poland, so-called refugees. And that group included many Polish citizens of the Jewish origin, predominantly Polish citizens of the Jewish origin, again in hundreds of thousands. And they also went to Siberia, but luckily in June, okay? Then we still have one more deportation. Oh, I'm sorry, I went back too far. But there is one deportation that, you know, it makes you even laugh because this is the deportation of June 20th, 1941. And this is the deportation focusing on the Polish intelligentsia and those who escaped previous deportations. And if you think about it, those deportation trains were leaving Western Poland towards Siberia and Kazakhstan at the time with the, when the Nazi Luftwaffe was entering the Russian sphere of influence when the, when the Nazi Germany army was crossing into the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, instead of thinking how to defend themselves against the na Nazi invasion, they were preoccupied with persecuting the Poles and sending them uh, to the oblivion. That's for waves of the deportations. And the point is what's important to know is that because we can evaluate um, how big those deportations were. Um, and um, what's important is that there is the, um, they were stopped because probably they would have many more waves of deportation but for the German invasion. What's important is the Russia, uh, American intelligence report from 1943 prepared in London 
compare the, the deportation list and the categories of deportees with the categories of deportees from the Lithuanian order, because th that, those documents were available. And in that report, uh, the conclusion is made that the Polish deportation orders had much broader categories of people to be deported than the Lithuanian orders. So in Lithuania, out of three million people, they, a prescription list for deportation included 700,000. And that was on a limited scope of the categories for deportation. The, the deportation list for, uh, lists for Poland, because they were much broader, they would impact much larger percentage of the uh, population in the uh, conquered Polish territory. Um, now, those are the uh, picture of those Polish people sent to Siberia, beautiful Polish ladies in the taiga or in, in, in Siberia, the family of children and women primarily. And then below you have a group of Polish orphans, a massive, massive um, production of orphans, if you will. Uh, what happens then, we have a sikorsky maisky agreement, uh, Nazi uh, invade, and suddenly the Russians need the manpower, so they become friends with the Poles. And in the sikorsky maisky agreement, summer of 41, they say, we declare the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact null and void. So we uh, basically uh, withdraw our claims to Eastern Poland that we, the, 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 the Polish areas that we are talking about and the Polish areas that we incorporated to the Soviet Union. They declare that in this pack, pact. So great, you know, Eastern Poland is back, right? Uh, of course not. Uh, in, that, in that pact, they also, they also declare amnesty for all Polish people in the detention centers in, 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 in the Soviet Union. Everybody, every, we have some of, of the uh, child, uh, Sibiraki children. They always ask, amnesty for what? What did we do that we had to have an amnesty? And the answer is, well, amnesty for being Polish. Now you can be Polish and still alive. That's really, now bl briefly, I mean still, uh, I will be jumping through. Uh, so as a result, uh, there is a formation of the Polish army in the Soviet Union from those people deported. But it, of course, once Stalin resisted the initial attack of the German army, he becomes bolder and bolder and, uh, and disregards the, the uh, sikorsky maisky Pact because he feels strong. Now he feels he can resist, he can stand up to the Germans. So now he can squeeze the Poles again. In that very moment, in that window of time between uh, March of 42 and October of 42, General Anders, if, if, with the help of the British, is able to open the doors of those Polish detainees, refugees, amnesty, or those people persecuted in Russia, to go with him to, to, to evacuate the, the Polish um, army together with the Polish families, families of the soldiers, meaning all the Polish civilians, as many as he could, he evacuated to Iran through, through um, Krasnovodsk to Pahlevi, and he managed to evacuate 120,000 people. Out of it, 50,000 went with, to, to form the second Polish Corps and uh, won the Battle of Monte Cassino, those Sibiraki won the Battle of Monte Cassino and opened the passage to Rome for the Allied forces. Those Sibiraki from those gulags. And the family of 70,000 civilians, that is a horrible chapter of the history that we, as a humanity didn't even start scratching. I will just run through the pictures. Those are the Polish children in Tehran when they arrived to freedom. Uh, majority of them didn't make it. And uh, I will show you this lady. Uh, she lost her grandmother first in Siberia. She lost her mother on her way to freedom, still in Russia. He lo she lost her father two months after reaching uh, Iran, uh, Persia. And then she lost her little brother on October, the six-year-old brother, on October two, uh, 1942. And um, she never knew where her brother was buried. This is the picture that she got. This is the picture of the 
Polish cemetery in uh, Tehran, in Durab. She got this picture a year ago, and she said this is the most precious possession, the most precious things in her, thing in her life. The first time she was able to see the place where her little brother was buried, and that is 45,000 Polish citizens buried in that cemetery, and this is not all. Those are all the places when the Polish refugees were spread throughout the world, through, like you see, Lebanon, Palestine, India, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rhodesia, South Africa, New Zealand, Mexico. A major, massive, climatic, climatic impact on the entire international community. Many of them, this is an orphanage of the Polish, uh, Polish orphans in India. Many people were left behind. Only 120 made it. But it is estimated that 300, uh, 350 to 500 were left behind and were lost forever. My presentation does not include, does not even touch on the context of persecution before and after, on the international lie, on the complicity of the international community in this crime, on the geographical impact just briefly illustrated, and on the generational impact. This crime reverberates in the fourth generations and many generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, um, Professors Barrett and Ledford. Um, we do have about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, I can take the questions, and if you can uh, state your name, and then please tell us which panelists you are directing the question to. Yes, I'm George Backlar. I represent the Committee in Support of Solidarity. Just one second. If you can just wait for the microphone. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, my question is directed at uh, Dr. Uh, Ledford. I appreciated his remarks. I thought he was very succinct and uh, precise. My question, however, is you referred to the govern Polish government, and you didn't say government in exile. And I also wanted to, I, I'm not saying this is a criticism, but I'm suggesting to you that people don't realize at this same historic period of what was going on in Poland, and of course, we have the benefit of hindsight because we know what happened. Was uh, the, the, the Lublin government being formed in its infancy, uh, which then led to Stalin's imposing the Lublin government on the Polish people following uh, the end of the war. But my point was, people need to understand the distinction between the Polish government and the Polish government in exile, led by Mikołajczyk following the tragic airplane crash in Gibraltar, July 1943, of Sikorsky, right. who had been in one of, your, one of the pictures here, shows Sikorsky with Anders in, in Moscow with Stalin with the list of the officers in December 1941. So that was my only comment. I thought your remarks were very succinct, but that one little inaccuracy, uh, or not inaccuracy, oversight, it's the same one I have with uh, people who refer to Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia as the Baltic states when they're really republics. They're not, they're not like West Virginia or Maryland or uh, those places. Thank you. Well, I mean, it, it's actually a little more complex than that. And I, in interest of time, I excised a reference to the efforts that the Polish government made uh, f uh, from really 1940, when the letters stopped, uh, until um, uh, uh, 1943, to clarify the question of where these officers were. The, the Polish government never gave it up. You have the, the Western government, you have the Moscow, then the Lublin government, and then you have local Polish administrators in the general government who are trying to make the lives under terrible conditions of German oppression as, as easy as possible for their fellow Polish citizens, to whom the Germans then turn when they need a Polish delegation. Uh, and, and those local administrators who are always facing the accusation of being collaborators with the occupiers 
Uh, it's like the councils in the Jewish ghettos. Uh, it's a terrible dilemma that these people still on the ground in the general government face. So, so there are even more actors uh, representing Poland uh, than you suggest. The government following the September campaign, they wound up in France. This was a legitimate... Oh, sure. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not denying... I'm not denying that at all. London following the debacle of Dunkirk. And that's what I'm referring to when I say the government in exile because the Moscow-Lublin one is entirely a creature of the Soviets. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Hello, I have a microphone. Oh. Hi, I'm John Kurowski. I'm a practicing lawyer and I uh, teach as a visiting professor at Copernicus University in Poland. Uh, professor Barrett, thank you for your presentation. I thank enjoyed you. the historical context of Justice Jackson. My, my question was, Justice Jackson, as you've told us uh, in his thoughtful testimony, said nothing prevents this from going forward. Um, and he got an interesting commentary from his colleague in Britain. But is there any evidence in your research that and this is 1952, did anyone followed up uh, after that or was any discussion about, well, maybe we should do something about this because by then we didn't like the Russians very much and they didn't like us and, and I think we know the answer, but if not, what were the legal and political, uh, what was the legal and political obstacles or climate then that prevented uh, that from happening? Um, the answer is no, as, as you suspect, and it's interesting, the Madden Committee issues a a, an interim report in 1951, which has an interesting little conclusion tucked in it, calling for an international tribunal like Nuremberg to prosecute the perpetrators of Katyn. By the time of the December 1952 final report, and Jackson and Kempner and Stammer have all testified in the interim in early 52, um, that has dropped out. And I think that's just a measure of Cold War realism. Um, you know, accidentally, because of uh, the Soviet abstention, the United Nations could authorize a response to the North Korean incursion. But the idea that there was an international organization, and we only had the UN, we didn't have an international criminal court, we didn't have states parties, any, you know, any architecture for it. There was no institution to sort of pick up this vague idea, which was there in 1951, and still there as an open possibility in Jackson's testimony, but not something the Madden committee is grabbing by the end of 52. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, um, Dr. Anna Spinder, I'm a medical doctor, but from Chicago. I have a question for Professor Barrett. You did mention that um, the Polish government in exile was sort of passive during the Nuremberg trial. Is that right? I mean, yeah. could it have been because there were uh, maybe some double agents in that uh, government? Oh, it's, it's very complicated. There are uh, Poles in London who are part of the United Nations War Crimes Commission, which was a, an intra-war fact-gathering body, um, who are counterparts alongside the London Conference and trying to participate. There are then other Poles uh, who are on the ground in Nuremberg. It's very unclear what their independence is or their connection to the Soviets. Um, they're not part of the principal four at the tables on the bench or at the prosecution. They're among the 20 subscribing nations that are consultants and diplomatic allies and spectators. Uh, and it may well be that sort of sense of, we don't know who we're dealing with. And the other question is for um, Maria Schoner. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, the figures regarding the number of victims um, are sort of controversial as far as Poles who, who were sent to Siberia. And a lot of individuals argue as to what the precise number is. Of course, we'll never know what the precise number is. But what is the latest estimate as to the number of individuals that were exiled? I know of two million. Are there any other numbers? And if you could just uh, uh, yes, it. absolutely. Um, it has been it has been for many years believed that the number, according to the estimates of the Polish government in London, uh, based on the reports from from the those uh, people exiled, and based on the reports from the Red Cross, it was estimated between one and a half and one and eight million. 
Uh, however, the documents that were released, uh, declassified uh, by the Russian Federation in the 1990s. Based on those documents, uh, Dr. Guryanov was involved in uh, uh, preparing reports of that, of those uh, deportation lists on the receiving end. And uh, those numbers come to get close to 320,000. Uh, of course, there are many questions about this total number that is presented in the documents released. The first issue is that those uh, lists were compiled at the receiving end of the deportation journey. And as we know from the first deportation, the death rate during this six weeks transition to the oblivion was at least 10 percent. Um, but uh, we would never know exactly. Uh, this, this, uh, there is a second problem, and that is fundamental problem, that uh, the Russian Federation is um, 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 conducting a selective uh, declassification of documents, and only the, the documents that they, they wish they declassify. So absolutely, we, there is no reason to believe that those are the complete lists. And also, the, another issue is that um, based on those people who escaped uh, to, to Persia and those who returned to Poland after the war, based on the data, including also the, the, those Polish people who were uh, forcibly forced to serve in the Red Army, okay, those numbers show a m much, much higher uh, number of persecuted Poles. So this question is, uh, in my opinion, still open to debate. Thank you, Maria. Unfortunately, I have been informed that we do not do not have any more time for questions. So please uh, join me in a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> Okay, we have um, a pre-lunch speaker, so uh, 15 more minutes and then uh, you'll be able to go off. Um, you've heard today how the U.S. Congress played a key role in exposing the truth about Katyn in 1950, and Congressman Kucinich this morning expressed his willingness to get Congress to re-engage in the issue and challenged us to provide the ammunition that he would need to do so. Well, we are doubly blessed to have with us this afternoon, or just before the afternoon, um, Congresswoman Mary Kaptur uh, of the U.S. House of Representatives, who will be addressing us for the next 15 minutes. Um, relevant to the topic of today's conference, Congresswoman Kaptur is of Polish heritage. She was the first member of her family to attend college, but she ended up attaining a Ph.D. in urban planning and development from MIT. She was elected to Congress in 1982, and she has risen in seniority so that she is now the senior most woman in the 112th Congress. She serves on the very important House Appropriations Committee and also on the House Defense Subcommittee. We are so happy to have you here today. Um, I, I believe this is your first visit to our law school. Is that, is that to correct? The to the law school. <laughs> and, and we hope um, that we'll be honored with your presentations in future conferences as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Am I allowed to turn this down? Or does that do something? Is that all right? I don't want to shut off anything here. What a pleasure and honor, truly. Did something happen? Oh, that's so you can see me. Uh, what a pleasure and a great honor and privilege it is for me to be here today with you. I um, looked forward to this session with great anticipation. And um, I know that my dear colleague, Congressman Dennis Kucinich, was here earlier this morning. Uh, he and I work very closely together. For those of you who aren't from Ohio, uh, both Congressman Kucinich and I represent parts of northern Ohio. Our district goes almost from the western border of Ohio along the southern rim of Lake Erie until it almost meets Cleveland. And then Congressman Kucinich and other members take over. So we are from the part of Ohio that I like to think 
is the progressive part of Ohio. <laughs> and uh, in fact, in the district that I represent uh, is a college called Oberlin College, which was the first, the first, in the United States to admit women and minorities. So we like to think of ourselves as a place that sees the future. And um, my first degree was taken from the University of Wisconsin, where I was a major in history and never taught any of this, even though, I'm a second generation American, by the way, uh, even though I specialized uh, in uh, world history and the history of World War II. So it's very interesting to go back and read the texts that we were taught and to see that this had no place in it. Mr. Adamczyk, you did not have a place in the texts that I was um, studying from as a student here in the United States long after World War II uh, had ended. But the motto of the University of Wisconsin contains these words, the continual sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. And I have viewed my own life as a truth seeker for a very long time. John also tells us, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And I think that is why we are here today. We are in the great tradition of both the United States and our Constitution and the tradition of Poland's first Constitution. But I can guarantee you that most Americans do not know the nexus between those two Constitutions and how what happened in our country carried the flame of liberty forward when in fact what happened in Poland was exactly the reverse in terms of what happened at the political level, though the flame of that liberty was carried by her people even until today. So we really are very, history has been waiting for us and waiting for us to be here today at Case Western Reserve and this great, great law school. Um, Maria, I want to thank you very much for the work uh, that you have done with the Cressy Siberia Foundation, which is extraordinarily important in the district that I represent, we have individuals who should tell their story and still have not in the work of that particular foundation. I also consider everyone here today to be very noble and to be a part of a very worthy effort to make history right. Mr. Adamczyk, you honor us by your presence and by your courage and by your carrying the flame of liberty forward so that the world shall know the truth. You are a very strong, you, a very strong and a very honest man. All of us can be enlightened by you. I think that for those of you who aren't of Polish heritage, but also love liberty, um, I like to say that the Poles love it more. And if you're lucky to have a piece of that heritage in you, you know how to persevere. It is not therefore surprising that in the Congress of the United States today, three of the foremost senior members in the House and Senate are all of Polish American heritage. In the House where I serve, it was mentioned that I'm now the senior Democratic woman in the U.S. House, but Congressman John Dingell of Michigan, also of Polish heritage, is a senior male member. And in the Senate of the United States, Senator Barbara Mikulski, is the senior woman. We only lack the man <laughs> over there in the Senate. But it's very interesting because I think that that quality of perseverance comes from great hardship. And Poles know how to persevere. And Polish Americans have the duality that they live with where perseverance and the love of liberty are first. Um, I happen to be the author of the legislation that took us almost two decades to build the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. That's a story unto itself, but it is an incomplete story. And I will tell you, when we first began drafting that legislation back in the 1980s, <clears throat> we had hoped that a part of that legislation would include a museum. Because I'd seen a museum in Caen, France, during my travels, and I said, uh, that Museum of Peace is something that should be replicated in the United States. <clears throat> and as I traveled Europe, I was told by others, oh, the Americans will never do that. And I said, well, maybe we can prove you wrong. 
They said, no, no, Americans are just into science and technology. They're afraid of history. Interesting from the European point of view how they would view the American character. I didn't quite agree with that, but the museum did not survive the bill. Uh, we wanted to actually build it in a uh, section under the memorial, if any of you visited the memorial, that could be a room like this. Uh, and uh, we would have artifacts, we would have um, a way of people coming a hundred years from now and understanding that the greatest legacy of the 20th century was the victory for our country of liberty over tyranny. We still haven't adequately represented that. Uh, but we're talking with people and foundations that have been set up. And we do have a Veterans History Project that is part of the Library of Congress where we're trying to <coughs> assemble personal stories. Maybe some of you and your families have contributed to that. Uh, we now have over, oh, I think it's close to 200,000 American stories that are a part of that. But what I learned from that uh, project <clears throat> was that some of the bravest Americans I knew could not have their stories placed in the archives because they were not born in the United States. One of my dearest friends, whose pin I wear today, who was a soldier in the Polish cavalry and served two years, was actually at Mokra when the uh, Nazi tanks came over the border uh, on, in September of... Um, 1939, September 1st, 1939, um, and lost 75% of the soldiers in that unit, and then went to fight on the other side of Poland three weeks later when the Communists and Red Army invaded from the east, and then served in the underground for two years until a mistake was made by one of his colleagues who ultimately was beheaded, and he was revealed and was then placed at Auschwitz and um, Gross Rosen and Leitmeritz. Even though he'd been an American citizen and his daughter had been the valedictorian of our class at St. Ursula Academy in Toledo, Ohio, and had raised his family with his wife who'd been tortured at Ravensbrück, their story could not be told because they were not born in the United States, they were naturalized citizens. And I came to fully realize as a member of Congress, oh my God, how incomplete our history really is. And what can I do as a, as a citizen of our country to help to make American history complete and the history of freedom and the fight for freedom complete? And I realized, as many of you do, what great effort that still takes. And that's part of why we are here today. I've asked myself many times why has it taken 70 years? I listened to the excellent professors and the ambassador who's kindly joined us today. Why has it taken 70 years? I'll tell you an experience I had two years ago that was a shock to me. Prior to my going to Poland, um, not paid for by the government, but by myself, uh, two years ago for that 70th anniversary commemoration, uh, we wrote the President of the United States a letter. <clears throat> and um, I am a member of the Polish caucus inside the Congress of the United States. And we asked that Americans of very high ranking join us at Gdańsk uh, for the official global commemoration that occurred during the month of September. <clears throat> and we asked perhaps someone from the executive branch to join us. and. Um, we never got an answer, but as we arrived at Gdańsk, and I traveled with the U.S. Ambassador Victor Ash from um, uh, Tennessee, who was our ambassador at that point, um, he said, Marcy, who's going to represent our government? I said, sir, I don't know yet because we haven't gotten an answer. You know, I always say security. That's always the reason we can't tell you because of security. <clears throat> we ended up, uh, the United States, even though um, we had the uh, Angela Merkel of Germany and Nicolas Sarkozy of France and uh, Vladimir Putin came from Russia. Uh, I ended up being the highest ranking uh, official from the United States of America, and I actually do believe the House is the highest ranking uh, as I look at the ebb and flow of American history. 
But uh, I truly expected someone of the level of Secretary of State from our country, and they weren't there. So uh, General Jones, who headed our National Security Council, uh, was the individual who represented the United States. But I thought the vacuum continues. I mean, that's how I really read it, as not so much as a member of Congress, but as an American citizen. This tells us how difficult it is to make history complete and to continually sift and winnow until one can get to the truth and liberty can be seen uh, in its fullest form and the sacrifice that has gone to make the very idea of liberty continue to live as a concept in the world. Um, one of the uh, efforts that we are making in our own region, uh, and this is something our family is doing, working with our local history room at our local public library, is trying to create a shelf called At Freedom's Edge uh, to try to identify individuals, whether they be Polish-American, whether they be African-American, Chinese-American, the horrible, horrible sacrifices that these Americans who have a duality, they are Americans plus. They have a Chinese heritage, they have a Polish heritage, they have a Hungarian heritage, whatever that might be, that their stories not be lost to history. And we are helping to write these stories, to record these stories, and perhaps in the various places from which you come, you might consider dovetailing with Libra Foundation, the Cressy Siberia Foundation, or organizations in your own area. Because I really believe as a member of the House, it takes a long time to do anything of significance. But if we are to be a democratic country, and that's with a small d, that means that people have to be empowered themselves to take their history forward. And we have to find ways and means to do that locally. One of the best examples I know here in Cleveland is with the Ukrainian American community, where the Fedinsky family and the home that they lived in has become a museum and behind it now in archives. And I've been able to help them a little bit but the tithing that has gone on in that community has created an extraordinary resource here in Cleveland, the likes of which every ethnic group in America should copy. And my hope is that the archival collections that are being housed there will eventually be able to be virtually restored to Ukraine. And the same could happen with Poland, and the same could happen with nations of Africa, and the same could happen with China someday. And we think about what we can do as individuals. Change is possible through us. Now, I know that it's time for lunch, and you're probably all hungry out there. Uh, but I have some thoughts about what one might do uh, to carry forward the learnings from this conference. First of all, you need a task force. You know that. If you're going to carry knowledge forward, no one does it alone. So there has to be some sort of umbrella effort that is organized. In the Congress, we divide ourselves up among committees, but we also have organizations that we self-identify with. For example, I'm a member of the Polish Caucus. I can tell you Polonia in America hardly comes to us with an idea. The uh, major idea that has been promoted by the organizations of late has been the Polish visa waiver issue. That is an important issue, but it is not the only issue. And it is not the issue that is most important to most Americans of Polish heritage. It is a subset of something larger. And so my challenge to you is to think about how to create another issue that you could bring to an organization like the Polish Caucus, which in the House is headed by Congressman Dan Lipinski of Chicago. Mr. Adamczyk, you're from, are you from Chicago? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, there are both Republican and Democratic members of this organization. Congressman Kucinich heads the Russian Caucus on his side of the aisle. I co-chair the Ukrainian Caucus. People say, Marcy, why do you co-chair the Ukrainian Caucus? You're of Polish heritage. I say, because it's the next rung in. And uh, so we, we, have to, we have to see our way forward. So I think that if 
an effort, whether it would be something through the Endowment for the Humanities, where we would try to restore archival records in some way, whether it would be an amendment to the Veterans History Project to make it more complete. Really, we need to talk about that. We have plenty of smart attorneys in the room here who can help us figure out. I'm not an attorney, by the way. Sometimes that gets in the way of creativity. Uh, sorry, I say that in a law school. Uh, but I've been in Congress now 29 years. Uh, so, um, but, but I do think that um, there are means to get into the Congress um, in terms of, of a proposal. And there are agencies uh, and programs, even the library services program at the federal level, which could be very important if several organizations would network and would come together with a proposal. Um, the, uh, uh, the last point that I really want to make uh, before lunch is that um, uh, this is a very important conference to me personally, and I feel very deeply the incompleteness of history. And if any, I think to myself, if any nation can do this, surely America, the United States, is the place that can help to push knowledge forward. That is our responsibility as a free people. But as I look at those who may be here from Poland and are of Polish heritage, uh, certainly a nation that cracked the enigma during World War II, certainly a nation that produced Marie Curie, certainly a nation that wrote the most democratic constitution in Europe in 1791. Certainly that nation can also meet the challenge of a new era and make history complete. Thank you so very much. It's been a privilege to be here.